right off the bat. So this is Nothing But Basements, where we sit here and talk about basements. Today we've got Rick Frack with Bilco. You're the regional manager? Regional sales manager, yes. Regional sales manager. Uh, Rick and I have actually worked together for a long time, So, but I don't think I've ever asked you this question question which is so who is Rick Frack like a little bit about who you are history well history is believe it or not is I uh, got out of high school in 1975 was a graduate of uh, Northampton High School left from vocational technical school where I was a mason by trade cool I didn't know that yeah and I actually went to work for a precast company installing the uh Precast basement steps. Mm -hmm. So so basically, I've been around Bilco Door since 1975. Wow. Yeah, I left I left the company for three years and came back in '81 as a sales rep, and I was in sales rep from '81 to '91, '92. I went to work for Bilco in '92. Wow. So um, that's awesome. Yeah, I've been been around the basement doors for a long time. I haven't seen much changes in the doors in many years, but that's probably a good I thing. I don't know. I disagree. I think Bilko's done a great job changing their doors. We they're have. They're making their doors better. We have, yes. There, there have been some changes, and uh, quality-wise has always been one of their their bigger factors mm-hmm. uh, onto the product itself. But they, they've improved lift systems and uh, finishes on the door now and, uh, you know, moved from a plant in West Haven, Connecticut to a pretty modern plant out in Zanesville, Ohio. Uh, a lot of the same equipment because basically it's uh, you know older technology. When did they make, do that? When did they make that move? Uh, Two thousand and five. That must have been tough. It, Just did a lot up. of people move? Uh, no, no, not a lot of people move. They, they, uh, they uh, basically you know gave everybody severances and packages and moved on. Yeah. Started pretty much anew out there, and the reason they moved out there was uh, the. With the uh, the introduction of the window well line, mm-hmm. uh, we sell by far more window wells in the western part of the country than you do in the eastern part of the country. So we were looking at trying to get centrally located for shipping. Getting and, shipping down. Yeah, and then we, we have a couple of the largest blow molding machines in the country and a pretty impressive size injection molding machine that they put in the plant out there. So they started with that in 05, and then I think... I think it was like 06 they moved everything else into the uh, the facility out That's there. That's really cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So how long has Bilco been around? It started in 1926, I believe. I think officially it's 29. And it was uh, George, George Lyons Sr. Uh, started uh, making actually railings and things around the boating industry. Uh-huh. And um, he had four sons, and uh, somebody asked him to make a bulkhead door. And then it became one bulkhead door, then two bulkhead doors, and three bulkhead doors. And all of a sudden, uh, we're making a bunch of basement doors. And uh, basement doors is only part of the Bilco company. We we manufacture quite a bit of commercial products. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the business was in the Lyons family up until about five years ago. And then it was then it was purchased by Amesbury Truth. Yeah. You know, Time Incorporation is what who owns us. So residential versus commercial, which is, which commercials which doing bigger? Commercials, commercials doing larger, more. Yeah. larger business. Yeah, uh, basement doors is you'll find, uh, Chris, as you know, is uh, started in New England. Mm-hmm. It's still very very strong in New England. Uh, as you move south and west, you're going to find less basement doors like. Right. You know, typically Harrisburg, Pennsylvania is the the cutoff line for the major percentage of basement doors. Uh, of course, in the South, it's it's not the fact that you have a high water table, which is what everybody always tells us. High water table, they don't use basements. No, it's just not a it's just not a common building practice. Right. They don't need to go down as far into the ground because of freeze thaw, so right. they can build slab on grade, crawl spaces, things that. Right. Exactly. Don't require a, a, a bulkhead door. Um, Pacific Northwest, nothing up there. More window wells than anything. We really? still we still sell. I was traveling uh, during the downturn in the building trend in in oh eight oh nine. I was traveling through Denver, Colorado. We were out trying to sell window wells, and uh, I look in this field and I see 
a basement door, and just in the middle of a field. And then I seen another one, and then I seen another one. I'm going, what the heck is this all about? And it turned out that they used them for gas pump stations. They used them as an access to get into these pump stations for the the gas lines out there. Right. So that was interesting. But no, uh, not a lot in that area. Uh, Chicago, Minnesota. Some, some. So. I mean, we have we do have distributors in the Midwest, but not not the volume that you see in this area. In this, in the Northeast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I guess I would have thought that it would have been consistent just in the north by itself, but I guess no, it's, it's window wells. It's weird. Uh, you get you get out west. You'll have uh, window wells like you, you'll take Denver, Colorado, Salt Lake City. They'll put five to seven oversized window walls on a basement. Mm-hmm. And that's their uh, access, but they their their main emergency escape and rescue, I should say. But their main access is through the basement. I'm sorry, through the kitchen. Yeah. And so they don't they don't really use the steps. So they may use a walkout or an areaway, which is an open areaway. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Um, so one of the one of the other things I wanted to talk to you about, or just kind of get some insight, because from a manufacturing perspective on a heavy steel product and how the supply chain has affected you guys over the past couple of years. Well, I mean, anybody has gone to the grocery store lately, you'll find that your, some of your favorite products may be there, may not be there. Uh, when Bilko first started, when I first started with Bilko in, in 92, uh, we used to buy all of our steel came in rolls. Mm-hmm. And we had a, um, I think it was called an RBI machine, and this was this huge machine that took the rolls and it would stretch them out. <laughs> and we would, no we would, yeah, we would cut them, we would stamp them, we would uh, do everything at the plant. So they, they from uh, the time that steel rolled in until it rolled out as a basement door, uh, we did it all. And uh, back in, uh, I think that started around 2005 or six. We started looking at lean mm-hmm. and lean manufacturing. Yeah, and, that's. I, I'm curious as to how that was through the supply chain. Well, it it changed. It cha- yeah, <laughs> it changed everything we looked at. We I remember changing to lean uh, manufacturing, and if you're not familiar with lean, basically is if everything works properly, your the steel that you need is coming in Monday night for Tuesday's production. And you no longer will manufacture an inventory of a thousand C style doors. That day, if you're scheduled to make ten C's, you'll make ten C's, twenty B's, and you change, you change everything in between. And we've gone now from uh, taking the rolled steel. We've gone to blanks, where we have another manufacturer that stamps the blanks. But once that comes in, then we'll punch the holes. We do the bending. We do that. So. Uh, supply train, chain issues have been a problem. They're smoothing out a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, the 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 problem with pricing in the steel market is just you know uh, been crazy. It seems to be leveling out a little bit better. Yeah, uh, that must be tough to navigate. Yeah, because obviously, I mean, I know you know on our end as as a as a buyer, it, it was pretty tough. You know the the price increases we were getting on a pretty consistent basis over the past couple of years. Those definitely have slowed down, which is nice. Mm-hmm. But I can't imagine a commodity like steel and how that impacts your ability to to even yeah. have some consistency. Well, that that that's part of it, and you know price increases were uh, becoming a pretty regular basis. That that seems to have leveled out now. Yeah. But on a manufacturer's Point, you, you you know it's just the steel it's the cardboard for the it's package it, yeah it's the packaging it's the uh, the parts and pieces that you don't get mm-hmm. or you'll have you can't get this gauge steel yeah. so you go you'll go up a notch to do something right um, paint getting paint paint was an issue there for a while I remember trying to go and, and go to my local Home Depot or Lowe's and and get a can of spray paint. Yeah. There was nothing on the shelf. Right. Well, think about buying 500-gallon <laughs> tubs of this paint the right. same way. I mean, it, it, it's scheduled to come in. You might get a delay of a week or two. So it changes the whole thinking of lean, and lean is just in time. So everything is delivered so you're not having an inventory on both ends, manufacturing and 
on uh, product, making the product. Right, yeah, so, no, it's basically on-demand manufacturing. Exactly. Which, you know, I I guess in a, in a climate that we've had for the past two years would be tough because as at least, you know, if you've had a bunch of steel in stock sitting there on the shelf, <coughs> the prices started going up, you know, you're in good shape. Right. You've got all this inventory of steel that was bought at a very low price. Mm-hmm. But if you're doing an on-demand type manufacturing, that you're really susceptible to the price oh, sure. swings that sure. occur. And that you also bring up a good point about the little things, the other pieces of the mm-hmm. puzzle that nobody thinks about. Sure. Steel's a big one, obviously. Sure. But for instance, for us, you know, we install a lot of sump pump systems and check valves, PVC, was impossible to get. Like oh, sure. the, the uh, clear check valves that we buy, plexiglass became something that you could oh. not find so that component was holding up our ability to have a steady stream of sump pump systems to sure. get installed unless we change it up and put something different in which you hate to do because it screws up sure you know uh, it just screws up the product you're used to putting out there i mean i, I had that same situation with plexiglass with our covers right for yeah. our window wells and i had a very upset customer um really upset with me why we couldn't deliver covers <laughs> and i i finally got to the point have you been to the grocery store have you been to the to the bank or anywhere and she said of course i was and i said i have and i said well then you've seen all of those lack of a better word sneeze guards that people put up right. I said, that's a lot of the same material we use <laughs> yeah. there's a shortage of it you can't get it yeah it it COVID was in, in 40 years of doing this, COVID was a, a real learning experience for a lot of companies. Right. Yeah, no, it's been a, it's been a challenging, just from, from a business standpoint, it's been really challenging navigating the past two years. And I think even, you know, one of the things that concerns me business-wise going forward is now we're entering a climate, this inflationary climate that we're in, that anyone who's been doing business in the past 40 years, you know, last time this mm-hmm. happened was in the nineteen seventies. Right. Well, most of us, you know, my company is only twenty five years old. We've never experienced an inflationary climate like this, so it's big question marks as to how to navigate it properly. Well, I I, <laughs> I, I laugh at that. A little side story is that I hear the people complaining about five percent interest rates on homes. I, I tried to buy my first home; it was nineteen percent. Right. And you needed twenty percent down. Yeah. And you were making one hundred fifty dollars a week, so you know. Yeah, you were ten, you were ten years older than me at that time, so you definitely change, yeah. you were in it and understand it better. You know, I talked to my dad mentioned that too, is how sure. interest rates were just insanely high back then. Crazy. And obviously, we're you know unfortunately on that same trajectory now. Right. But um, it's just it's it's from a business environment, it's been challenging to navigate and I think it will sure. continue to be for at least the next couple of years unfortunately sure. and I'm sure you've, you've had the same problems everybody else has had was with labor oh yeah getting Labor's people, tough. getting people I think any any business ours yours manufacturing any any industry that's dealing with blue collar workforce is, is a struggle mm-hmm. because everyone wants to work in tech or on a computer or some gig deal Mm-hmm. Which is all fine. I'm all for it. It just makes it very hard for us to find people who are interested in Absolutely. what we do. Absolutely. So, I mean, I, I remember talking to you about the challenges you guys were having at the plant. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was different, you know. It was different. But, but it was everywhere. Yeah, It right. was everywhere. Yep. It was everywhere. I mean, every place you went, lumber yards, it, it was the same people. And, and it, it, it tended to see, to see the, the older people were there working. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that had anything to do with it or whatever, but they were they were uh, seemed to be the, the the diehards that came yeah. and went. And I know it was the longest year of my life sitting right. at home after traveling for that long. Yeah, right. But um, yeah, that that was one of the other challenges. But it seems to be leveling out pretty. It good. does seem to be getting better. I think one of the things it it exposed for me was that you know we're not, and I th- I know the bill goes the same way is. Like it takes a certain skill set to do what we do, mm-hmm. to manufacture a solid door, or to, to put in a good, you know, installation on a on a basement. You need skilled people, Absolutely. and 
if if it means it's going to take longer to get it installed right, then I guess it's going to take longer because we're not just going to go hire anybody and Correct. not train them to do it right. Correct. Because that's worse. I guess the old saying used to be, if you don't have the time to do it right the first time, when are you going to have time to do it again? You know, and <laughs> right? it's just as simple as that. I mean, the, the, the simple things, you know, with anything, like a Bilco door, I mean, the, the simple thing with installing a Bilco door is level, plumb, and square. And it's, it's like anything. It's like life or, or building a home. You start on a good foundation. If you have a good foundation under anything, it's going to last. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you go and you take a door, a Bilco, and you stick it on, a, uh, for lack of a better word, a, a, a crumbling foundation, it's, it's, it's not going gonna, not gonna to be a good installation. You've right. got to make sure that you start with something solid. Mm -hmm. and, and that starts with the team because getting right. the people that can do it and understand it. Understanding it. Mm -hmm. I think that's the key is understanding it is so many people, you can talk about it and you can, you can show people what to do, but if they don't understand why they're doing it or what the reasoning is behind it, that's where I think people get a little bit lost because sure. then they can cut, they, they'll feel like cutting corners and doing something faster is okay because they don't understand right. the, real, the, the real importance of doing it doing and taking care of these Correct. certain things. Correct. So, but yes, I agree with you, things are getting better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We're able to put orders in and they actually, yeah, they, they, oh yeah, they they're getting out. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah. Uh, we're, yeah, the orders are getting out of the plant now. In, in, in within, that four within week the budget. Window, yeah. yeah, that four week window, which is perfect. Right. Uh, we can plan accordingly. That's good. Um, so, Let's move into talking about the doors themselves. And one of the things I love about Bilco's doors is how they have tried to make improvements on something that's pretty basic, mm -hmm. which I think is really cool because that just means to me that Bilco is thinking about what they're doing and not just sitting back pumping out doors. Right. Um, and I think the, to my perspective, one of the biggest things that they've improved is these gas-powered, easy open, gas assist, springs. the gas springs gas on spring. the doors. I mean, I think it makes all the difference in the world because that, <laughs> like, well, just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, it, it's funny that you, you talk about the improvements on the doors. And like I said, I started in, in, uh, 1992 it was, and uh, I had four basement doors and four extensions at that time and a stair stringers, and, and that was my, in my, my, my bag of tricks or whatever you want to call it, yeah. bag of what products that I walked around and sold. And uh, after a few years, we introduced the lock kit, and it was a pretty basic uh, type of an opener. You know, it was a torsion rod system that uh, the torsion rod basically held the door and worked as a as a spring and worked as a uh, uh, hinge pin also. Mm -hmm. And then we we gradually moved into what we call the uh, the the better or the second generation of the torsion rod, where it went where it had a cam on it, where the spring rode on the cam. And basically, it would aid in the lift of the door and the descent right. of the door. Yeah. And then uh, the next generation moved into was this gas piston, which basically everybody associates with the same type of piston that you have on your hatchback of your car. Of your car, right. Yeah. Right, right. And a lot of people remember the old Vegas and the Pinto hatch, and things that just didn't last so long. But Bilko has a five-year warranty on that, on that lift, and... What that does, basically, it helps two ways. One, it aids in the lift, makes mm -hmm. it lighter to lift. So you're taking a 65-pound door leaf, and you're making it weigh about five to seven pounds. But when you let it go, even if it's halfway through the lift and you would let it go, it's not going to come crashing down. It works almost like a storm door closure. Right. So it'll, it'll slow the door down and allow it to settle down, you know, pretty um, slowly. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone has a little bit of a different variation in the yeah. thing, but but that's the general design in the product. I definitely think they're better than the tension rods. I don't think you could do that. You can let these things go, right. and they'll slowly close. Right. You couldn't do that, at least in not my recollection. 
Well, the biggest the and biggest, feel confident that they weren't just going to slam shut. Right. The biggest thing that people didn't understand about uh, the torsion rod system. It's a good system. It was, it was what was out there at the time. Right. Uh, but nobody ever lubricated that little plastic. Uh-huh. Or there were some very creative ways that people took that and I, I was on a job or two where they manipulated it and they stuck it in between the hinge bracket and and I'm looking at I, I took pictures of it because I couldn't believe that they did it, but it, it did work and it worked for a time. It was better than the first than torsion the first, rust. Right. Yeah. I mean, I go back to uh, seeing doors that had the old feather action operators, which was a. a um, couple coil springs that went up to a U and had a roller on it in the center of the door and when you lifted the door up it would it would kind of help with the lift and and oh by the way if you have them available people would buy them tomorrow because one of the biggest problems Bilko has as, as a salesman I'm, I'm typically typically only going to ever sell you one Bilko door in your lifetime because if you take care of it it's going to last mm-hmm. you know so Everything that we did made a little bit more of an improvement. Made a little bit more of an improvement. I, I agree with you. I think the gas springs are yeah. a much better improvement right. than, than the, the torsion rods. Um, well, and you, I mean, you mentioned about them, you know, getting older, wearing out. But they're also very, very easy to replace. Oh, absolutely. I mean, as a do-it-yourself, I mean, you can replace them on your own. Absolutely. And like you mentioned, those other torsion rods and, and <laughs> the configuration of them. Yeah. Not so easy to replace. I mean, if you're an installer, it's one thing, but right. if you're just a homeowner looking to, you know, replace something, the gas-powered um, sure. shocks are much easier. It's just a little snap clip. You just snap right. it off, pull it off, put the new ones on. And yeah. again, they have a five-year warranty on them, and we we replace very few. Yeah, very few under warranty. I mean, they've been they've been they've been really good. I mean, it's yeah. been a real good system. Most of the doors we replace don't are not using that. Uh, second generation torsion system they're older than that mm-hmm. and they're pretty deadly doors <laughs> just smashing doors. well you know and we and we talk a bit about that um, you talk about Bilko you know every basement door is a Bilko door I mean I have people come up to me at shows and say that my wooden Bilko door is leaking <laughs> and I look at them and I say we never made a wooden Bilko door so there, there's other there's other manufacturers out mm-hmm. there uh, but Bilko is really one of the one of the few, uh, one of, probably one of the only ones that actually has a system on it that seems to, to really help with the lift. I mean, it, it does help with the lift and the descent. Yeah. And uh, again, we we get the bad rap because it's 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 a metal basement door and it's a Bilko. You know, it's well, maybe not. You know. <laughs> well, I, I think the other thing is a Bilko door system looked better. Um, as a finished product as compared to some of the others out there. Having, you know, we, we were talking earlier about the, you know, the flange, the mounting flange mm-hmm. that's inside versus outside and how much, I can just say aesthetically, it's so much more appealing to have that flange bent in because now your fasteners and, and all the actual um, mounting hardware is inside. Correct. Not visually seen not being exposed to the elements there's just so many benefits to it and you can seal it up better absolutely <laughs> yeah and you and you get into some of the other features of a bilco door uh, the header at the top is j channeled yep so any water that would come down off the house gets into the into the the the, the, the j channel on the header and diverts left to right so it can go run off the door itself and the header is is actually um for lack of a better word, winged or angled at the ends, so it diverts the water truly off the ends of the door itself. Mm-hmm. Um, the internal hinges, or the internal flanges, everything's inside. Right. Like you said, you're not looking at nuts or bolts or something hanging on the outside of the unit itself. The sill is a low-profile sill. Mm-hmm. It's not a uh, piece of angle iron or a that piece of round steel. Hazard. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, you know, so it's low profile, so you can't get your heel on it going in right. and out of the basement. Um, and it's one of the areas that's walked on. And, and yeah. Very durable, very, very durable. I mean, it, um, the the uh, lift systems, again, we talked about that. But the hinges, 
one thing about the hinges on the uh, classic series doors, and we, we, we kind of classify them, all of our doors are classic series, so we have what's called the classic series doors. Those are the ones with the triangular sides. Yep. Uh, and then we have what's called our BR door, which is goes on existing sloped masonry sidewalls. But the classic series has a hinge system that's internal mm-hmm. so that when you actually lift the door open, it lifts the door up and away from the side piece. Right. So that it's not pivoting on the side, which is a uh, which is a nice feature mm-hmm. for that that style door itself. And then we have a series for the the size C, which is the most popular. We have a series of extensions right. to extend the length of them. Yep. And in addition to all that, you guys have also started powder coating them and offering right. uh, factory coated doors, so people don't have to paint them right. inside so, and out. So. Talk to me a bit. Uh, I'd be curious as to the learning curve <laughs> that Bilko had to go through well, to get there. Yeah, it was a. Uh, of course, every 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 powder coated manufacturer would like you to have a uh, automated system. Yep. And uh, we this is this is a hand applied system. So basically, the the doors are manufactured normally, hung mm-hmm. on the line. They're washed. Um, if they're going through the primer, then they're, uh, they, they get washed, they go through, they get a, a, a primer, Sherwin Williams primer on them, and then they're baked and then packaged. If it's a powder coat product, it gets pulled off the line after the wash, and then it's taken over and it's hung on, um, on racks. And if you understand powder coating, it's a uh, positive charge to the paint and a negative charge to the, to the steel or vice versa. Mm-hmm. And uh, basically, you're spraying this, and it's a powder. Yeah. And it's sprayed on, and then the material is taken from the spray booth area, rolled into an oven where it's baked, and it bakes the primer and it finishes it, and um, and then it's packaged at that point. So the learning process basically was, um, you know, getting consistency and and getting consistency of people mm-hmm. to do the job. I mean. Uh, part of lean manufacturing is is that uh, it's one piece flow, but it's also standardized work. So that if uh, you're not in the work today, I should be able to take that job <laughs> yeah, right. and do it. And and that's and that's the way the people are trained at that. But if if um, you're doing it on a regular basis, you may have a an area where you get into a little bit better. And this time, you know, the next guy might. Uh, not miss the area, but not get as good a coverage. So it's a learning process, and, it, and it's, it's continual. Uh, we are, we're constantly testing it. We do salt spray tests mm-hmm. on the material, and the salt spray test would be as if you took the the product and you put it in a saltwater atmosphere, and you know they're getting into the hundreds of hours right. before you're getting any failure and things. And then always looking at different opportunities for. Uh, Color, same color choices. I mean, we started with four. Yeah, you're up to six. Six now. now. Right. Yep. Uh, they seem to be the pretty standard, standard colors. And right now, you're only doing two sizes, Bs and Cs. Bs and Cs, correct. That's that's eighty five percent of our sales. Yeah, that makes sense. Is anyone else doing? That? Are you guys the only ones? That we have offer? a lot of we have a lot of people that'll do it aftermarket right but i mean any manufacturers any other not to my knowledge no so you guys are by yourselves there right that's nice oh yeah it yeah we are and it it it's uh you know it's quite involved i mean to get a package to get a package i mean just to just to just to get a package to protect the product is Mm -hmm. is a big thing and and our package does a very good job at it. yeah the packaging is much more elaborate on the powder coated doors for sure oh yeah the, the, the things you can't control is to take that lovely package and give it to an LTL trucker and, <laughs> and, and say, deliver it to, uh, you know, Hootsick, New Hampshire, mm-hmm. and, and get it there in one piece, yes, but, you know, it has forklift holes, so it's heavy product. Right. So, you know, you, you're always at the mercy of the trucking companies and things, but yeah. it, it, it relatively is a, uh, a pretty nice feature. And... A lot of people, I mean, I've gotten calls already where people complain about, you know, um, a primer door and rusting three or four years down the road to, to find out that they never painted they the never inside. Painted it, right? or, or they never painted the inside. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've laughed. Uh, started working for Bilko in 92, and I got a complaint from a customer in my own hometown. And uh, the door was rusting through. It's only on the house 18 months. And I drove up to this house, and, I, and I'm standing there, and the, the person come up, and they said to me, they said, well, you know, look at this, 18 months old. I said, sir, I said, the store's older than 18 months. And he says, how do you know? I said, I installed it in 1976. <laughs> and then we had a day coat on it. And then I, I pulled the washer off the day coat, and I showed him when it was installed. So it was never painted. Yeah, it was right. never painted. I mean, I remember one time when Bilko went from the primer red to gray, and nobody ever painted the doors because they liked the gray. And awesome. oh, by the way, gray's our number one seller in, in powder, powder coating. coating. Yeah, right. yeah. We we actually made one that was the uh, it's called brick color, but it looks like the primer color. Mm -hmm. We thought nobody painted the doors, so they would like that color. It's not that as big a seller <laughs> as we thought. It was. Right. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, any other features, like any other talks of improvements or changes? Well, we did. We just recently we... made a change to the uh, our flat door. So, if you have existing existing slope masonry sidewalls, we had we introduced. We had a product years ago was called our SLW door, slope yeah. wall door. Right. <clears throat> and we had five different sizes, and they incorporated the the lift system in the uh, torsion lift system in that we had years ago. And um, that, that door was fine. It worked great. A lot of people liked it. The issue with it was is you would take a nice size opening and reduce it down right. to make that door work. So now we, uh, we came up with called our BR series, uh, Bilco replacement, and we have three different sizes of that door. And it's flat on the bottom. But as Bilco has always said, that they always wanted to have some type of a lift system on it. Mm -hmm. So that has uh, actually two different systems on it. It has a gas spring, which helps in the lift. But what happens with a gas spring is when it gets to a certain horizontal position, Doesn't they give much. up. Right, exactly. So we put a series of coil springs on it, mm -hmm. and the coil springs then take over and allow the door to, to glide down or close. And you can manipulate the coil springs to, uh, you know, depending on the pitch that the door's on. Yeah. And that's been working real well. And that has a series of extensions, three extensions for each door. Mm -hmm. But it it uh, works very well for that. Our stair stringer product yep. works real nice. You can use those. Then they're used to create the steps that go down into the basement. Yeah, the stair stringers are great. Yeah, they work good. And if you have something large to take in and out of the basement, you take them out. Yep. Get it, put them yeah, down no, there. Easy to do. Yep. The keyed lock, I remember that was the... That was the first new product that I had working for the Bilco company in 90, I think 95, we introduced the keyed lock, and I think that was the first product line, basement line, product line extension mm -hmm. that Bilco had in a long time. And that basically gives you keyed access from the outside. Yeah. And uh, after that, then we introduced the SLW. We have the Ultra Series. Right, the fiberglass. Which is, yeah, it's plastic. Plastic. Yeah, high high density polyethylene. It's a blow molded product, mm -hmm. um, and that that comes in the size C with a, a six and a twelve inch extension, so you can use that in multiples mm -hmm. to go whatever length you want. Any any metal that's in the door, like the hinges or the sill, is either powder coated steel or aluminum. So it's kind of like um, everybody wanted daylight in the door, so it has a little pop out pop in yeah. windows yeah, on the sides. That. They wanted ventilation. You could put a screen in there. Uh, they wanted uh, to look like wood, so it looks like wood on the surface. I mean, it's everything you want. It's the, whatever you want to call it, the Cadillac of basement doors. Um, and it works fine. Uh, then we, we did come out with our BR door, and then uh, it was at the SLW at that time, and then Bilko has, this, of course, a series of window wells right. that we yeah. also have. Yeah, the stack well and the escape wells. Um, I guess the only other thing I wanted to touch on was issues, like some of the issues we've seen. I think one of the biggest issues that we run across, or complaints, is, you know, every, we, we install these doors and people are always talking about the daylight that they see, which I always find funny. It's an exterior, you know, bulkhead mm -hmm. hatch, mm -hmm. and it never is going to be free of light. Right. Bilko, 
Bilko has always said that any real security or any real weather tightness or air tightness is your door at the base of the right, stairs. Right, exactly. So you, you can't take a, uh, you know, a Bilko door and put it on and have a curtain at the bottom of the steps. It's, it's, it's just going to allow cold air to come up. It's going to cause condensation. Right, and we see that all the time. We try to explain that to people. It's like you, you need your Bilko door is meant to work in conjunction with a thermal insulated exactly. basement door because that cold air from the basement hitting a hot bulkhead it's going to condensate you know, exactly <laughs> i mean we've seen it as bad where it's like raining oh well oh, you yeah. know oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and if if it's damp enough in the basement and the temperature delta is big enough between the two um so yeah we try to uh, we explain that to people and we've actually brought on you know we'll, we'll install doors now it's part of the process because sure. you, know, you tell people that's what they need and you don't offer it yeah <laughs> they get annoyed well yeah and exactly yeah. but you know the the and i don't want to call technology i mean this again this this design hasn't changed much no since since i mean I've seen some old doors that some of my installers have taken off. Uh, it really hasn't changed much since the 30s and 40s. No. And uh, there's things that, that can happen. Like when you close a Bilco door, you should be able to see daylight around the doors, across the bottom, uh, along the sides. That, that's normal. And I would say, you know, up to the thickness of a credit card mm -hmm. on the sides is normal. What happens is if you actually get a door where the uh, underside of the door is touching on the flange on the side piece, it'll actually cause what's called hinge binding and it won't, won't allow the doors to close properly. Mm -hmm. So those gaps are made to be there. Uh, they're also, uh, I was told this many, many years ago, they're also there to allow air circulation in that, in that area. Mm -hmm. So you get some air to circulate through there again. The base of the steps. That's where your your main thing is. Right. You know, not picking on the state of Maine, but everybody in the state of Maine believes that if you put a door at the bottom of the steps, it's going to cause that areaway to, to lift up and break off. Uh, believe it or not, yeah. And uh, when I asked him, I said, well, you don't think that the weather is as cold in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, you know, where we sell a bunch of doors to? Mm -hmm. You know, everybody puts a door at the bottom steps. I'm just up there, they don't believe on it, believe in it at all. I mean, I, I went to a job one time where the ice was probably about six inches thick in the areaway because they had all that heat coming out from the basement, and it just it just literally caused all this condensation. Right. So a door at the bottom of the steps seals it up, the air circulation flowing through. Mm -hmm. Now we do make the weather stripping kit, which is now available. Yeah, and, what and that, that helps. Yeah, it helps, sure. and it closes up some of the larger gaps. Right. Okay. It's just an, another common people concern people have is bugs. Yeah. And, and mice. Uh, but it is more outside. I, I, I get it. But if you've got the proper door set up at the base of the stairs going into Correct. the actual basement, then bugs and critters and whatnot won't be migrating into your home. Correct. Yes, that's they may be trapped simple as in, that. The, in the bulkhead area, mm -hmm. but that's as far as they're going. Yeah, as simple as that. And then once the... Once the Bilco door is installed, you know, as concerns and things, is, is the, the real only maintenance, especially with the gas springs on it now, is basically to keep it painted yeah. down the road. Keep it, you know, touch up the paint. Uh, it's a metal product. Mm -hmm. It's going to uh, need maintenance. I mean, your, your, your Jeep, if you keep driving it around, you know, year after year after year, you're going to have to maintain that. So right. it, it, it's something that needs to be maintained. Uh, but in the short of it, that's it. And... You know, a lot of people don't realize, Chris, and I know you know this, is that um, the the value that that can add to your home, because you know, by adding a basement access or maintaining that basement access, that makes your basement could be created in a livable space. Well, yeah, right, exactly. I mean, especially when you're, I, I think that the the egress window wells in particular. Are very undervalued in terms of what the transformation they can have on a mm -hmm. basement. 
I, I mean, the bulkhead for access is fantastic, especially if you don't have access. Correct. Like, we can go in there, cut open, cut open the foundation wall, attach, uh, you know, permacast mm -hmm. sure. entry with the bulkhead, and all of a sudden you've got in and out access into your basement without having to go through your house, which is huge. Sure. If you've never had that. Exactly. <laughs> and then you combine that with, if you're talking about finishing your basement, and instead of having those small, you know, windows that they have, actually putting in a full window well, especially the, uh, it's the escape wells, especially right. the escape wells where you can actually do landscaping and plantings. Oh, and, sure. I mean, it's really transformational. Yeah. Being a Vilco salesman, of course, and selling both products, I'll get calls from people or questions from people, you know, what would you do to your basement? And, of course, I say I would do both. Right. You know, because it's kind of, it, it. if you think about it, I'm, I'm a woodworker. And um, where does the average access to the basement inside the house come in, into the kitchen? Mm -hmm. I could just see my wife looking at me as I came <laughs> in with a 4 by 8 sheet of plywood trying to get it into the basement. Right. Plus, if you're going to remodel your basement and make it living space, you, you'd want a way to get the materials in there, plus your couch and everything else. So it, it's nice to have the direct access with the basement door. And then the window walls give you a lot of natural daylight. The natural daylight is huge. It is huge. It, we, we used to have pictures years ago. When we first started selling uh, Bilco, believe it or not, uh, we, we purchased a company called um, it was RM Base years ago, but they made the original escape wells, and they were mm -hmm. out of Colorado. And Bilko brought that product in, and uh, we were the first ones in the East to, to really start trying to promote escape window wells. You just mm -hmm. didn't see it. It, it, just, it just didn't happen. And uh, I remember the struggles of trying to talk to builders about putting that in because everybody put the hopper windows in. Yeah. Now you see the codes have changed, and the building codes on new homes now require you to have uh, right. the secondary Maybe. access. Right. Where a lot of people get in trouble is that they already have their basement finished mm -hmm. and they're trying to sell the house and they have a bedroom and they can't count that as living space because right. they don't have an access. Yeah. And you can do that. I mean, no, we, we, well, yeah, you can retrofit it in. It doesn't, finished or unfinished doesn't really make any difference um, to us as installers. And, you know, when you're talking about building codes and just life safety in general, mm -hmm. you know, if you've got a bedroom or a living space in the basement, You've got to have two access points. Obviously, you have the ones going upstairs, but you need another way out mm -hmm. if that's blocked or something's going on to prevent um, you from getting out through the house. Correct. Right. Um, and, you know, granted, yeah, they, you know, for a retrofit, you're talking anywhere between eight, ten, twelve thousand dollars, depending on what you have to do. But that's peanuts if you're talking about saving somebody's life. Oh, sure. And I, and if you're looking at trying to sell a home that has another 1,200 square feet of living space in the basement. Right. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't look like you're in a cave. Exactly, yeah. Uh, you know, when you're trying to create a home theater, great. You don't want windows. But if you're looking for a bedroom or a home gym or, you know, a family room, you know, you're looking for natural light if you can get it. Absolutely. As far as uh, the future, I mean, Vilco is... Uh, always looking for ways to improve the product mm -hmm. uh, looking at different features I don't you know there's only so many things you can do uh, different applications so who knows where where Bilko's going to end up in the future mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to products like that now and uh, it's, it was nice to be family owned but being owned by a company that has some engineering background to help now yeah you know, right a little, a little larger company it makes a difference no, that's cool. And of course, we'll, we'll end on this. This will probably be one of your last podcasts <laughs> that you do as you move on to the next chapter, whatever that may be, yeah. as you retire. <laughs> yeah, move it, moving on to the... Uh, I thought about being the Boko installer, but I, I kind of give that up. I'll leave that up to the professionals. You have a job here whenever you want one. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I find like New Hampshire, right? Coming moving from Pennsylvania, it's just... The same things, a lot of trees and rocks. A lot of trees, you know, rocks. You light know. and water. We're a little bit closer to the coast. <laughs> yeah, you are. Yeah, yeah. And she likes the beach. So, uh, But no, it's, it was, it, I, it's hard to believe that um, 
in today's day and age to be with a company for yeah 30 years and I always we always tease because you know Bilko is sold through distribution points lumber yards Chris mm-hmm. and things you know rest kind of thing but we do a lot of shows and I see the same faces but we always tease they're not always wearing the same logo yeah on their shirt right. so to see somebody with the same logo for 30 years is something and if you look at the Bilko sales force um, right now there's there's three sales reps well our our uh, sales and marketing manager I think he has 39 years Wow the general manager of Bilko I think he has 40 in that in that frame myself at 30 Chris who is uh, covers in some areas in Pennsylvania in the West he is 25 and then our youngest guy Mike has got 10. Yeah. So it's, See, it's that's a huge testament to you guys, to the company, because obviously to to instill that level of loyalty and commitment, you got to be doing something right. Yeah, and they, they sure. do a good job, and it, it 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 is nice to have nice customers too. I mean, there's yeah. always some, but yeah, yeah. It, is, it is it is what it is. But. Uh, yes, there's always some, but a majority. Thank God for the ninety eight percent. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I agree with that. So. But uh. Well, it was awesome having you. Thank Good. you, Rick. And uh, thank you, Chris. And I hope you guys uh, continue doing Bilko into the future. Uh, we have no plans on changing. Absolutely. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. Thank you very much. Appreciate okay. it. Awesome. Thank Thanks, man. That's been fun. That was that was fun.